Zulu. Now there's one of the few words, a word like Timbuktu perhaps, uh, out of Africa, which rings familiar to, to most Westerners. There are some sound and less sound reasons perhaps for that. Um, in any case, uh, we see things like Hollywood movie productions. Michael Caine's first movie was called simply Zulu. Uh, another movie, Zulu Dawn with Burt Lancaster. These were both uh, about episodes in the 1879 war between the Zulu Kingdom and the British. And probably it was that war, Rudyard Kipling's poem written in the aftermath where he saluted the, the courage of the by that time defeated Zulu that, that first put the, the Zulu word on the Western map. And it's, it's multiplied ever since and shows up in, in some uh, surprising places. In the 1980s, a 10-hour, no less, TV series on the king we'll be looking at today, Shaka Zulu. And in much more silly fashion, you find it showing up in the form of uh, the so-called Zulu king and Zulu queen on Mardi Gras Day in New Orleans wearing costumes that, I must tell you, have no resemblance at all to, uh, to traditional Zulu uh, attire. I come from North Carolina, and we've got a, a prominent uh, uh, bluegrass band down there called uh, the Red, Red Clay Ramblers, who have a, one of their crowd favorites has a lyric that actually combines our two terms. It says, how did the Zulu soldier lose the Battle of Timbuktu? He couldn't wahoo, wahoo, wahoo. Now, it's interesting lyric. The Timbuktu and the Zulu heartland are about 4,000 miles apart. Nonetheless, it kind of shows the currency that, uh, that this term has, has had. Let's, let's bring it back to, to a historical basis today. In the last lecture, we described a changing and expanding Cape Colony. And while that society's frontier was moving decade by decade, north and east, towards the southern Bantu world, the societies of that world, the world to the east of that 20-inch rainfall line, were changing in dramatic fashion as well. In the next lecture, we take up the collision between the two, the frontier history uh, between the Bantu and, and Europeans. In this one, we want to examine the southern Bantu transformation occurring on the eve and overlapping somewhat with that collision is centered on the Zulu story. For nearly a half a century, from the late 18th century, very late 18th century, through the first decades of the 19th, the peoples and communities of the southern Bantu world experienced revolutionary change, marked on one hand by disruption, upheaval, and turbulence, on the other by creativity and innovation. For, whole, uh, for a long time, the whole process has been referred to by by scholars uh, as the so-called Imfakani. Actually, if I were to pronounce that correctly, it would be something close. I'm only going to try this once. To Imfakani. There would be a clicking sound there, and again, as is so often the case, and we've seen it a couple of times already in this course, language tells us something about history. We know that Khoisan languages, the original languages in Southern Africa, had a whole variety of clicks. Well, the southernmost Bantu languages, languages like Zulu and, and Mandela's language, which should be pronounced something like Kosa, with another click, actually borrowed actually four basic clicks, borrowed into their southern Bantu languages sounds that are originally from an entirely different language family, the Khoisan. This, of course, is a linguistic evidence of a long history of interaction and coexistence, etc. Uh, between the two uh, language families in southern Africa. All right, back to the Imfakane. Uh, the direct translation of this word from Zulu would be approximately the hammering or the crushing. Now, some have objected to this term uh, in the sense that it connotes only the negative and violent side of this process of change. I happen to agree with that view, but since no one has suggested a useful alternative to refer to the whole process of change over a half century or so, I'll continue to use it despite its loaded nature perhaps and uh, put it in, in quotation marks. Now, 
If you'll permit me, I'd like to fast forward for a second, cut to the chase, as it were, and, and enumerate three main ways that the Infocane process altered uh, this southern Bantu world by the time that it had played out. First, we go from a large number of small-scale states, chiefdoms, seems a, a, as good a term as any, to a smaller number of large-scale ones. This was a process of political consolidation. And we find the emergence of considerably more powerful and larger uh, kingdoms in its, in its aftermath. Second, as elsewhere in the world, there's most definitely a, milita a military side to this consolidation. Uh, that's certainly been in the, in the making of major powerful states. Uh, this is usually the case. It's certainly been the case uh, in most of the major states of Europe. It's certainly the case in the, in the making of the American nation. So it should not surprise us that that would be the case here. These larger units did involve a, an intensification, uh, an increasing a centrality for the art and science of, of military uh, warfare. The ethnic map, and this is my third great change, the ethnic map of southern Africa was, was remade. It was recast. Ethnic identities expanded and contracted. So we see once again the notion of fluidity of identity uh, as we did in our last uh, lecture when we talked about the, the birth of Afrikaner and colored identity. Some people definitely relocated. You can go to parts of Southern Africa today and hear languages that were originally spoken in source areas hundreds of miles uh, away. We'll look uh, a little more closely at that uh, further on. So again, political consolidation, uh, the construction of larger kingdoms, uh, a more serious and central role for, for military uh, arts as part of that process, and a reshuffling, a recasting of the, the ethnic map. Now, let us return to uh, our focus here on the kingdom which, in a lot of ways, is at the center of this process, although I want to stress throughout that the Zulu story is only a part of this enormously wide-ranging uh, transformation that affects the entire uh, subcontinent. Now, the story of Shaka and the founding of the modern Zulu kingdom illustrates, in a way, all three of the dynamics I, I just talked about. Shaka and those around him were part of the Nguni subdivision of the, the Bantu, who lived between the Drakensberg Mountains and the Indian Ocean. This is the area, the province of South Africa today, known as Kwa Zulu, which simply means country of the Zulu. Again, Isi Zulu, the language of the Zulu. It's known as Kwa Zulu Dash Natal today. Natal coming from a name for the old British colony in that region. Now, Shaka's life story has provided endless fodder for psychohistorians most of them uh, amateur, uh, and it's easy to see why. It's, it's a fascinating tale uh, in, the, in the telling. Both his adult personality and his childhood experiences were, were unusual. They were outside of the mainstream or typical experiences, you might say, uh, for, his, for his time. And as uh, psychohistorians, <laughs> amateur or not, like to do often, uh, the, the linkage between the, the childhood experiences of younger life and the adult personality um, is, is sort of the, the substance of the, the, uh, the analysis for, for many. Now, as an adult, Shaka was reputed for his driving ambition, his fierce determination, and his iron will, in some accounts, for his, his outright cruelty. He evidently never married, nor had any recognized uh, children. Uh, again, well outside of the, the mainstream uh, experience there. Well, let's go back to, to his roots for a moment. Shaka was born uh, almost certainly in 1787. His father was the chief of the Zulu, the monarch of the Zulu. But, and this is quite important to our analysis today, I think, Zulu meant something very different at that point. 
It only referred to a small chiefdom there in that strip of very hilly, rolling, beautiful uh, subtropical land between the Drakensberg and the Indian Ocean, only to one small chiefdom, perhaps four or 5,000 followers, subjects of, of Shaka's father. Uh, and this was one among a number of small-scale states and chiefdoms in this part of the, the Nguni, the southern Bantu world. Shaka's father's name was Sinzanga Kona, um, and we'll come back to him uh, in, a, in a minute. Now, his mother was uh, a woman named Nandi, and again, uh, this, this figures prominently in a number of the popularizations uh, of, of Shaka's life. She was a, a strong-willed uh, and uh, self-reliant, to put it mildly, a uh, woman from the neighboring Langani community, which we, we don't need to be terribly concerned with. Now, if Shaka's parents, his father Sinzanga Kona, the, the youthful Zulu chief at the time of his birth, and his mother Nandi, if Sinzanga Kona and Nandi uh, ever married, and some of the oral sources do say that they were, um, others say they were not. If they were, it, it did not last. Uh, this was not a lasting union. And in fact, Shaka was raised by his mother, Nandi, very much under her wing, uh, rejected by the Zulu royal house, and raised in, therefore, in a sense, uh, in, in exile, estranged from the, the Zulu royal uh, line. At that point, it might be nice to go to um, a, a document which is based on Zulu oral tradition. Of course, powerful states generate more oral tradition. So there's a great deal of oral tradition about Shaka. And frankly, you know, you get differing views about Shaka that come through that. I, I'm giving you a rendering by uh, a, a, an early European translator and collector of, of some of these uh, translations. But you can see how uh, the notion of how did the, the child uh, affect the man here, the childhood affect the man, would come into this. This is supposed to be an account based on Zulu oral tradition of Shaka at, let's say, age seven or eight, something like that, uh, and so on. Let's go to it. It says, Zulu children dearly like to lick the porridge spoon. The bullies of the family would find great fun in thrusting this stirrer into the fire, and then, when almost burning, ordering Shaka to peel off the porridge, saying, Come, eat this, that we can see whether you are indeed a chief. And, of course, this is a reference to his uh, alienated uh, father. Or when he would return from herding the cattle for his midday meal, they would force him to hold out both hands, extended side by side like a saucer, into which they would pour boiling dollops and compel him to eat, threatening him with punishment if he allowed the food to drop. Then his little crinkled ears and the marked stumpiness of a certain organ were ever a source of persistent ridicule among Shaka's companions, and their taunts in this regard so rankled in his breast that he grew up harboring a deadly hatred. At that point, in some uh, accounts, you could almost fill in the blank. A hatred toward X, Y, anyone who uh, was not supporting. Well, you can see with accounts like this uh, why the... The, the amateurs would, would certainly have a, a ball with a Shaka's life story. Now, the world that Shaka grew up in was already beginning to change. I mean, he doesn't drop out of the sky one day and, and transform Southern Africa. He had predecessors and he had successors. He had peers who were engaged in some of the same things that he was engaged in, and that is this political consolidation and, and militarization of uh, Southern Bantu life. Now, one of his predecessors was, was Dingaswayo, who created a loose confederation of a number of northern Nguni chiefdoms, including that of Shaka's mother and the Zulu of Shaka's estranged father. Dingaswayo also started down the path of, of greater centrality for military life by injecting an element of military training into the initiation uh, process uh, uh, of the so-called Amabuto, which is the Zulu word for age sets or age grades, which we, we talked about in Lecture 6. Uh, at about age eh, 15, 16, something like that, uh, boys enter manhood, uh, officially, by going through uh, initiation schools 
uh, and so forth. And Dengaswayo injects an element of military training in this. And in fact, these age sets, these Amabuto, become the units, the regiments of his army, and we might call them age regiments at that point. So Shaka first distinguishes himself as a soldier in one of Dengaswayo's age regiments. Um, not every great general starts out as a great soldier. I mean, some, some do and some don't. In this case, uh, he did. He's definitely caught the eye and the favor of Dengaswayo, who in fact elevated him at quite an early age to become the commander of uh, his, his age regiment. Now, in 1816, Shaka's estranged father, uh, Senzenga Kona, died. And with Dingaswayo's patronage, his, his support, Shaka returned and seized the, the Zulu chieftainship in the 10-hour special that uh, I mentioned made for TV uh, and filmed in South Africa, by the way, uh, in the 1980s. Um, this is a very dramatic scene, as you can, as you can imagine, where you know, the rejected uh, boy is now the uh, towering charismatic man and he's come back to, to claim his birthright. Um, and as you can imagine, he does so with some violence in the, in the TV version. In any case, Shaka returns and takes the, the throne of the Zulu, if you like, although bear in mind that the Zulu is still only part of a larger confederation under Dingaswayo. But when Dingaswayo died in 1818, Shaka was, was well positioned to uh, move into to that vacuum left by Dingaswayo's death as well, and that he does. So in 1818, we enter into Shaka's one and only decade of, of real power. He took Dingaswayo's loose confederation and intensified the consolidation of power around himself and certainly elevated the role of the military. Shaka's army used a new and shorter stabbing iron spear, a much larger oval shield. These were devi uh, uh, designed for, for infantry advance in a, a, a something quite reminiscent of the old um, phalanx and so forth. He housed his regiments in separate stockaded towns, and in theory, he, he wanted a, a regulation which would forbid his soldiers to marry until they were 40, until they were 40, and they would be uh, rewarded, again, like Roman soldiers of old after, a, a, uh, after their period of service with uh, a sinecure and, and the per permission to, to marry. Now, certainly many died in the path of, of Shaka's uh, army, or armies, as he uh, engaged in, in the expansion of this, this state. But the survivors were not, in general, massacred or, or enslaved, provided they accepted Shaka's authority. Um, in fact, they were incorporated into the appropriate age regiments. And I, I should mention that there are, are female um, age regiments, which de very definitely play a, a supporting role in these uh, military efforts. So uh, a captured or surviving um, male or female in one of the communities in, in, in Shaka's path uh, would be uh, incorporated and absorbed into the appropriate uh, age set regiment. So a process that we might crudely term, and I admit it is a crude term, uh, we might call Zulufication, if you like, uh, was underway. People gradually who were not Zulu at the time, certainly of Shaka's uh, birth or boyhood, in a sense, and to varying degrees, became Zulu. Uh, they, were, they were dropped, in a sense, into a, a, a Zulu cultural bath. Shaka insisted that the particular praise, poetry, uh, and so forth of, of his uh, Zulu roots uh, be uh, adopted by uh, the, uh, the, the rapidly growing numbers under his, uh, under his rule. It shows, again, the fluid nature of, of ethnic identity, how it can expand and, and contract. And in a lot of respects, this is the key to the fact that Zulu today is the largest single ethnic uh, identity uh, in South Africa. So, Shaka, therefore, in my view, was um, a builder as well as a destroyer. Uh, he built a, a new nation. He built a new kingdom. And for a time, at least, he inspired as well as compelled uh, loyalty.
Now, the military campaigns of Shaka and others, because again, the Zulu was one of, uh, of, of several uh, similar experiments going on at about the same time, created the threat of insecurity over a wide region. How would people and how would people's uh, leaders respond to that? We already noted those uh, captured and, and incorporated. Now, certainly some people in some whole communities fled in destitute and desperate conditions, so desperate that a few are remembered on the high felt in the interior of, of South Africa as, um, as practicing cannibalism, one of the, the, the rare instances uh, of this in uh, Africa, despite the stereotypes otherwise. Now, others mobilize military and politically themselves, in a sense, in, in response to how do we offer uh, security in a time of, of the threat of insecurity. One of those was Mashweshwe, the founder of the, the modern Sutu kingdom of Le Sutu, and we'll take a closer look at him in our next lecture. Some took to the road, and I don't mean in flight or, or out of uh, fear and, and in desperate conditions. Rather, they were, in a sense, uh, states on the march. If you go to Western Zambia today, that Lozi Kingdom I mentioned at one point, in some contrast to my old friends, the Tonga in Western Zambia, the language spoken there is actually a language brought there by uh, a people from originally from the Sutu country who moved about a thousand miles uh, uh, northward and established themselves on the Upper Zambezi. Several branches of peoples known as Ingoni have settled far to the north in Malawi, Zambia, even as far north as southern Tanzania. And these can be seen as part of the, the sort of ripple effects, the kind of domino effects, the kind of shock waves, if you like, of this, this uh, Infocani process. And finally, I just might mention the, the Indebele. Uh, it was founded by Imzilakazi, who was one of, uh, one of Shaka's lieutenants, actually, one of his commanders, who proved to be mutinous and, uh, in a sense, uh, took his followers uh, then um, away from, from the Shaka-dominated center, crossed the Limpopo eventually, after stops on the way, and created a Zulu-style kingdom in southwestern Zimbabwe. We shall meet the Indebele people uh, again in a later lecture. Now, meanwhile, Shaka himself met his end. After his mother's death in 1827, he seemed to lose the acuity of judgment that had, had marked his earlier uh, reign. Uh, always one to, to push, to, to, to prod, to, be, uh, to expect, to demand uh, from his, his followers. It may be that he, he pushed too hard, sending uh, expeditions into the very tough, uh, pestilential in some ways, country of southern Mozambique, for instance, where a classic sort of quagmire situation um, developed. After his, his mother's death in 1827, uh, as, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, he, he, he seems to, to lose that, that judgment, and it may have been a matter of time uh, before uh, he was overthrown. That came on September the 24th, 1828, and Shaka was assassinated by a party of conspirators that included uh, his a couple of his half-brothers, that is, sons also of Senzangakona, but uh, by a different uh, mother. Uh, one of those half-brothers was Dingan, who succeeded Shaka on the, the Zulu throne in 1828. Now, Shaka's legacy has always been significant in South African history, and it's always been contested. Hero or villain? And sources from the traditional ones all the way th down uh, have, have shown elements of each. Apartheid-era whites tended to paint him as a, as a bloodthirsty tyrant, just the sort of thing to expect uh, without, uh, without white rule. Others saw and see him today as greatness himself, greatness itself, and, and wrapped themselves in, in his mantle. I mentioned uh, Mangasutu Butelezi, the, the leader of the Inkata movement in South Africa. I, I think it's fair to say a quasi-Zulu nationalist movement uh, in South Africa. And when I say wrap, wrap yourself in, in Shaka's mantle, 
uh, on public occasions, uh, Buttelezzi sometimes literally does that and, and very much uh, takes on the, the sort of um, apparel that, uh, that is reminiscent of uh, Shaka uh, himself. Now, the turbulent change of the Infocani has prompted uh, a, a, the serious question, of course, of, of origins, which historians are always talking about origins, right? Um, what started this ball rolling? You know, what conditions after centuries of what appears to have been um, relatively settled, relatively peaceful, and relatively prosperous life in this, in this part of the southern Bantu world, what is it that leads to this rather explosive period of, of, of change. Now, some have argued that our old friend um, long-distance trade is, is the key here, specifically in this case, uh, trade coming uh, in and out of the, uh, the port of, of Delagoa Bay, the seat of uh, the capital of modern-day Mozambique lying to the north. Uh, the argument goes that uh, the pursuit of control over access to prestige imported goods, again, the old Indian Ocean connection there, uh, inspired or, or impelled, was incentive, you might say, to mobilize uh, military and, and politically. Now, another explanation uh, I suppose we could call an ecological one, and the investigations into this uh, were prompted by some mentions in the Zulu oral tradition of, of famous famines. And again, all over the world, people have often marked, um, you know, times and, and periods by uh, natural calamities uh, such as this. Now, one of these uh, uh, cropping up in the, the Zulu oral tradition, uh, seemingly occurring uh, at some time in the late 18th century, uh, led some, some quite enterprise, I must say quite original researchers in Southern Africa to undertake an unusual form of, of research. They investigated, essentially, um, calcified uh, tree rings. And what they were looking for, of course, was evidence of years. They could date the trees fairly carefully with radiocarbon dating, but looking for evidence, in essence, of wide rings where it was a good growing season, and therefore uh, the, the, the ring would be relatively wide, reflecting a, a, a season of good growth, as opposed to very narrow ones, indicating uh, a periods of, of low rainfall and, and possibly drought. And their theorization, contributing to the origins of uh, the Infakani debate, would go something like this, that a series of good agricultural seasons led at some point in the, the late 18th century to an expansion in both human and cattle population, that this is followed by a series of calamitous seasons of, of um, uh, low rainfall and drought, and that therefore the greater uh, numbers of, of people and cattle had to mobilize to control and compete for uh, those limited uh, resources. Uh, finally, we must mention the radical revision of Julian Cobbing, who uh, in 1988, in an article, proposed an entirely different explanation for the, the whole process of the so-called so so Infocani. Cobbing argued that this actually had, uh, that, that in particular, the depredations or the, the downside of the whole Infocani process had very little to do with uh, African state building at all, that it was largely connected with an episode in slave trading organized either through Delacoa Bay or from the Northern Cape by Europeans. Now, this, as I say, was certainly a, a dramatic um, revision in understanding of the, the Infocani. I must say that in my view, uh, Cobbing's work has, has not stood up well. The evidence for his chronology uh, is simply weak. But, I have no doubt, the whites were coming. And that is the subject of our next lecture, The Frontier. Thank you.